NTR. Standing back there, thinking you were going to introduce me in English, and then I heard you talking this silly language. Yours. I gave them, <laughs> I gave them all the secrets of your book. Did you? Already, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you did many Q and As like these because I have to warn the public: um, you like Q and As, you yes. like questions from the public. I love it because I don't like saying the same thing that I said last night. That's right. not very exciting, no. you see. And. Um, uh, People who are not actors understand that. Why would anybody want to say the same thing night after night after night? Um, but but, but uh, it's absolute, that's how I feel about it, because I'm not really an actor, and that's one of the things in the book. Right. I'm much more a, a writer who happens to perform his own stuff, not least because the acting is paid much better than the writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of questions do you get when you do this normally? Are there any rude questions coming from oh, the audience? Oh, yes, I ask for rude questions, because they're, <laughs> okay. no, no, they're much more fun. They lead somewhere. The, you, the worst questions are California. 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 Mr. Cleese, you're just so wonderful. Could you give us some hints on how to be as wonderful as you are? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Awful fawning rubbish. Yeah. Um, so it's much nicer when people say, "Why can't you form a stable relationship with a woman?" You know, <laughs> oh. it's much more. Much, I may not have an answer, but it's a much more interesting question. Well, did you get that question, by the way? Oh yes. What is the answer? Oh, well, the answer is rather long, actually. Okay, no. I'll tell you my. Yeah. I'll tell you my favourite question ever was in Oslo. And a young fellow somewhere in the audience stood up and said, Mr. Cleese, I have a question for you. <laughs> I said, yes. He said, if you were a component part of an aircraft, <laughs> no. which part of the aircraft <laughs> would you choose to be? <laughs> the best question I ever had in my life. Yeah. Of course, I was able to say the joystick. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the parameters here for the audience, so we can go into personal stuff. Your, your wife. Oh, is there was okay. another good one. There okay. was another good Why one. Why don't you interview yourself? South, South <laughs> Africa. South Africa. Somebody stood up over there and said, "Mr. Cleese, do you hate your ex-wife?" And I said, no, no, I don't hate my ex-wife. I wish she was dead, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> I ran out of questions. I'm done. Uh, well, no, if, if she died right now, I would be 400,000 pounds better off. <laughs> And many friends have offered. They said, you know, we'll split the difference. Um, but the, the problem is, if she is found in Hyde Park with a dagger between her shoulder blades, there's only one person they're going to come to, you know? <laughs> so which one is this of the, of the three that you defined? Oh, this is number three. Number three. Number yeah. three. Is it always the last one that is the most vicious? No, I don't think so. No, I think this was a matter of temperament. In her case, mm -hmm. um, no. The first one I was married to was Connie Booth, whom you know from Faulty Towers. Yeah. Played, yeah. Now, Connie's great. <laughs> then I married my second one, who is no longer with us. I'm very fond of her, actually, mm. Barbara. But she. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that mm. was good. That was... <laughs> this is worrying uh, quicker than I am, so um, <laughs> I'd better speed up a bit. Uh, yeah. She was, however, an alcoholic uh, who suffered from bipolar. Um, 
problems. And uh, so it just goes to show I can't pick them, you know? Mm -hmm. Because the moment I said Eisner, I thought this is the one. <laughs> <laughs> But she only cost $4 million. <laughs> if, if we do the grand total, how much have you paid since the first one? Uh, $24.5 million. <laughs> I know it's quite a lot, isn't it? But uh, Alice Faye, my, my third one, she got $20 million, or at least she's had $20 million minus the $400,000 that I'm going to have to pay her next year unless she dies, sadly, tragically. <laughs> Um, is, well, is, she, is she like Ivana Trump, who said, don't get even, get everything? <laughs> about, that's, that's about right. She used to talk about being black-hearted. And I've never come across any other human being who talked quite openly about being black-hearted. Um, but it turned out she was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my, my, my Californian lawyer made a very good joke he said, you got off lightly. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, think how much more you would have had to pay her had she contributed anything to the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any warnings? I'm, I'm uh, married for the first time in my life for, um, uh, yes, some years now. Yeah. <laughs> How many Five, years? Nine years. Nine, nine years. years? Yes. That's very good, because I have been married, actually, for 38 years. But, you know, done in different... <laughs> sections. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you pick. Would you like to have the audience uh, have a go at you, or would you like to read from your autobiography? I think... Uh, why don't you ask me something extremely rude <laughs> that you're really interested in? Um, I was interested in the divorce, how that works. Yeah. Well, it's not a rude question, but I have been enjoying tremendously your book and your I'm writing. So pleased. Thank you. Yeah, really. And you're writing about your mom. Oh, yes. And. Um... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where it all started, yeah? obviously. Isn't it? Well, would you like to read? Yeah, that's... sure. I'll tell you, I've got a funny bit here yeah, about yeah, yeah. mom on page yeah? 10. Page 10. Yeah, that's the one I liked. Yes. Here. This is, is the this? English is this version. The... Yeah, yeah. Oh, Christ, it isn't. Fluid, the heat and the whole or something. Here we are. Um, I said, she used to, I used to joke, she was a fearful woman. I said, she used to joke that she suffered from omniphobia. You know, you name it, she had a morbid dread of it. <laughs> it's true that I never saw her alarmed by a loaf of bread or a cardigan or even a chair. But anything above medium size that could move around a bit was a hazard, and any reasonably loud sound startled her beyond reason. I once compiled a list of events that frightened her, and it was quite comprehensive. Very loud snoring, low-flying aircraft, church bells, fire engines, trains, buses and lorries, thunder, shouting, large cars, most medium-sized cars, noisy small cars, Burglar alarms, fireworks, especially crackers, loud radios, barking dogs, whinnying horses, nearby silent horses, <laughs> cows in general, megaphones, sheep, corks coming out of sparkling wine bottles, motorcycles, even very small ones, balloons being popped, vacuum cleaners not being used by her, <laughs> things being dropped, dinner gongs, parrot houses, whoopee cushions, chiming doorbells, hammering bombs, hooters, old-fashioned alarm clocks, pneumatic drills and hair dryers, even those used by her. <laughs> In a nutshell, Mother experienced the cosmos as a vast, limitless booby trap. And that is accurate, seriously right. accurate. You, you have much more to say about your mother in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, uh, when I did the introduction, I said she was also an inspiration for a lot of your comedy, maybe. I was she? Yeah, I think so. I think so, because she had, a very, she had a very unusual sense of humor, especially, if I may make a, a sexist remark, um, uh, uh, for a woman, because she had a very, very black sense of humour. Um, and that's much more usual in a man than a woman, in my experience. But she had such a black sense of humour, I was actually able to use it to cheer her up, because uh, 
She was depressed, because anxious people are depressed the whole time. Um, and when I would uh, telephone her, I would say, oh, hello, Mum, it's John. And she'd say, oh, oh, hello, John, how are you? I'd say, I'm fine, Mother, how are you? And she would always say, with a sort of a, a hint of surprise, she would say, well, I've, I've, I've been just a little bit down this week. <laughs> And I don't know why she was surprised, because she was a little bit down this week for 50 fucking years. <laughs> yeah? No. And uh, uh, it wasn't nice to hear your mother being depressed, you know? And one day she was... It's just where my creativity comes from. She was going through literally all the reasons why she didn't want to go on living. And I heard myself say, Mother, I have an idea. Oh, oh, she said, what's that? I said, well, Mother, if you're still feeling as depressed as this next week, I know a little man who lives in Fulham. And if you like, but only if you like, I could give him a, a call on the phone and he could come down and kill you. <laughs> There was this silence, and then she cackled with laughter. She really did. So any time after that, when she started saying she was depressed, I'd listen for a little bit, and then I would say, so, should I call the little man in Fulham? And he would laugh, she'd laugh, and it would cheer her up, and, and she'd say things like, oh, no, I've got a sherry party on Friday. <laughs> so, that's a very odd thing to make a woman laugh, isn't it? That, that kind of black humor. Yeah. And, and she... Was 101? She died, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> At the age of 101. And the extraordinary thing is that she was born in 1899. She died in the year 2000, so that her life spanned the entire 20th century, 1899 to 2000. From, uh, she lived through the, um, the uh, First World War the uh, Great Depression, the rise of Hitler and Stalin, Second World War, the atomic bomb, the foundation of Israel, the space age, the Cold War, the collapse of communism. She lived through it all without really noticing any of it. <laughs> we nearly fucked it up. <laughs> True. She had no, she had no curiosity. Uh, it's hard to explain because it wasn't that she had little curiosity. She had no curiosity <laughs> at all. And once, when I was uh, still married to Alice, for, hey, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> when I was still married to my last wife, uh, my last wife made a salad with little quail's eggs. Do you know what I mean? That little. Mm -hmm little quail's eggs and my mother said oh these, these are very nice what are they and I said well they're moles eggs mother <laughs> and she said moles eggs I didn't know moles uh, laid eggs and I said oh yes they lay, lay them and when there's a full moon uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they lay them at the, at the mouth of a burrow you see? Yeah. And if you go up there very early in the morning after a new moon you can collect the eggs <laughs> and cook them. And she said, well, I never knew that. <laughs> because she had no information, do you see what I mean, mm. that, would, that would contradict that. And another time she heard me talking about uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. And she said, oh, oh I, I've heard of Mary. Who's Mary, Queen of Scots? I said she was a Scottish darts player <laughs> who got killed in the Blitz. Yeah. And she said, what a shame. <laughs> no information because she wasn't interested in anything except what might be a danger to her in the next few seconds. So how much of her is in you? Um, less than there used to be. I, was always, I always carried a lot of anxiety, but it wasn't of the anxiety of that kind. My anxiety was extraordinary. It was, first of all, going out on stage and not being funny, because there's nothing more humiliating, I promise you, than going out, uh, sort of throwing yourself around and the audience not laughing. It's just a terrible feeling. And that's why comics talk about dying. 
You see, actors never talk about dying, but when you're trying to make people laugh and failing, that's absolutely horrible. So the stage fright I used to have was very bad. And my other fear was always if I could get everything done. I was always worrying about whether I could get everything done during the course of the day, because it always felt, or always felt as though there was too much to do. We have a, little, uh, a couple of clips lined up, and uh, remarkable because uh, I interviewed some time ago a colleague of yours mm -hmm. who has, when I was reading your book, I was thinking, well, this is almost similar. Ah. Have a look at this lady. I, I started getting longer and longer depressions. They used to be every five years, and it got quicker and quicker. What happens in your head when you... Nothing. Nothing happens. You're gone. When you're depressed. You're not thinking anything. You're just a slab that sits in a chair, and you can't lift your hand. I was born into a maniacs who didn't know that nobody knew they had mental illness. So put those two together and you've got dynamite. They were like Scud missiles. They would undermine me all the time. My mother would keep saying I was an idiot. And my father would say, look at you, you're as big as a house. Who's going to marry you? But you know, they, they, my mother was a maniac. You know, she would, she was always cleaning. Of course, nobody knew that on all fours, like a pool cleaner. And then her voice was like, who brings filth into a building? You know, so that was like her normal voice. It was, that was her saying, have a nice day. Mm. I always say with my background, I would have been a comedian or a serial killer. <laughs> Seriously, I would have been. But I had this way of making it funny. And so it was like getting rid of the devil. That's very interesting. Very interesting. <clears throat> I think she had it worse than I did by yeah. a long way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite a long way. It was, it was the, the, the emotions in my family were much more repressed, you know, but, but, but they English. were the English. Yeah, yeah English. So no and I'll tell you what, it, let me read it again, yeah. because it was terrible, terrible fear of embarrassment. And I'm wondering if I can find it. I'm not sure I can, but do you remember the speech that I made to Jamie Lee Curtis in yes. Fish Called Wanda? Yep. I said, uh, I think I remember it. I said, do you have any idea, Wanda, what it is like being English, being so terrified of embarrassment, going to dinner parties and not being able to ask someone, are you married, in case they say, my wife left me this morning? <laughs> Not being able to say, do you have children, in case the person says they were all burned to death on Wednesday. <laughs> we're all terrified of embarrassment, Wanda. That's why we are all so dead. He said, most of my best friends are dead. They, they, we have these piles of corpses to dinner. And when everybody is so scared about saying anything that might upset anyone, you, you, you know, it just gets very boring. It must be like dinner with a lot of diplomats, mm. where the only purpose of the dinner is not to offend anyone, you know. What did your mother think of all these films? Because we just saw this picture of you in your underwear in uh, Fish Called Wonder. Was she, oh, yeah. was she shocked by, by the scenes, or did she like it? No, when she saw me uh, first, after the first series of, of, of um, Faulty Towers, you see, I was, I was relative, what was I, about 36 years of age, and I used to use makeup to, to age Basil, because I thought Basil was in his 40s, so I used to put little lines in here around the eyes, you know, little eyes here. And when she saw me afterwards, she said, oh, you're looking much better. <laughs> But that's what would worry her, you know. Yeah. If I went on English television and said, let's all burn down Buckingham Palace, and then I rang up my mother afterwards, she would say, well, your hair was all over the place. <laughs> and it was, it was that stuff, you know, it was all about looking respectable. Yeah. Let's see if anybody here has a question for you. Yes? You have a pretty outspoken opinion about uh, certain people, for once, uh, you called the Belgians uh, quote, uh, greedy pseudo-French bastards, end quote. <laughs> but what do you think of the Dutch? <laughs> I have to tell you, this is absolutely true, because I just told you, on the way here today, I was thinking to myself, why don't I live in Amsterdam? I was actually thinking that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right? 
because it, 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 this is a civilized society. <laughs> Well, compared with anything else, I mean, you've got, <laughs> you've got Switzerland, Germany, and, and Holland, and a bit of Scandinavia. The rest of the world is stark staring mad. <laughs> right? Am I not right? So I was just thinking, it's beautiful. Amsterdam is the most beautiful city in the world. It leaves Paris trailing. And you've got beautiful shops, and everything looks so good here. And it, it doesn't feel like that in London anymore. People love London because the facilities are so good. But what's happened is that the nature of the city has changed so much because the people with the real money now are from the Far East, uh, from Russia, and from the Middle East. Mm. And so they have these enormous quantities of money, so everything is oriented towards them. But these are not great artistic cultures. You know what I mean? Right. Nor, nor, yeah. nor are they famous for liberal tradition. Mm -hmm. So that's why all the smart cars now look like military vehicles. You know, the, the Rolls Royces, the, the Bentleys, used to look elegant. Now they look as though they've been built to ram things. <laughs> because the people who buy them want to look tough, you know? And you know what? Tough is pretty boring. So I think that, thank you. Have, have, you been, um, have you been house hunting already? Or do you think, are you thinking of buying maybe a Yeah, my house? wife and I, she sent me, uh, tonight, she sent me an uh, email with a, with a property on it. Uh, actually in a place, not here, because she doesn't know we're moving here yet. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's a place called The Circus in Bath, mm. because Bath is one of the most beautiful cities in England, if mm. not the most beautiful one. And I was suddenly thinking how my, my strange little life has involved circuses, because the first show I did, Cambridge Circus, mm. Monty Python's Flying Circus, circus in Bath, and tonight I'm performing in a place that was built as a circus. Right. So circus is going through my life, you see, so. Yeah. You want to pick them out? I mean... I uh, know, you, you yeah, pick them Yeah, we'll, we'll both do it. Okay, here. Uh, do you remember the name of the book that Basil Fawlty has read six times, and why didn't you call your book that? <laughs> a fan. This is a... a Basil a real... read it? No, I'm interested, I really am. Basil read this book six times? Yes, and uh, the question really is, do you remember the name of that book, and no. why didn't you call your book that? It was How to Murder Your Wife. <laughs> I call this so anyway because one of the things I've noticed is that if people tell stories or anecdotes really badly, there's always a moment when they suddenly stop in the middle mm -hmm. and realize that they've lost the plot. <laughs> and they always say, so anyway. Uh, that, yeah. That's my little private joke about why I called it so anyway. Yeah. Over here. Yes, sir. Uh, the Pythons recently had a reunion. And um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like being uh, on stage together with uh, these guys after such a long time? Yes, because naturally, look, everybody who watch, watches Python would like us to be having dinner together once a week. Well, in reality, there are some years when we don't have dinner together. This is partly because we're spread out all over the place, but it's partly because we've all gone off in completely different directions. You know? Completely different. And Michael Palin, someone who would have become a close friend of mine if we'd not worked together, but I don't think the others would have done. <laughs> not because we dislike each other at all. There's a really good spirit between us. So we came back last November, it was almost exactly a year ago, uh, because we got involved in a court case where a, one of the producers on the Holy Grail managed to convince a judge that we had agreed to a contract in which he made as much money out of the spam -a lot as we did. Now, bearing in mind that we wrote it and acted it, you know, and directed it and so forth, it's a bit surprising that one of the producers managed to convince a judge that he should have as much money as each one of us. But he did. This left us with a legal bill of 600, 800,000 pounds. So we had to have a business meeting and we said, what, 
what the fuck are we going to do about this? I mean, it, was, it was so ridiculous, we were laughing about it, you know? We just thought, well, it's hopeless. And we brought in an old friend from Cambridge who'd been a lawyer, been a friend of mine. We used to go to lectures together, and he'd gone off and managed Queen. Not the Queen, but, the, you know, the, the musical <laughs> group. And he was with us, and he said, well, why don't you just do a couple of shows in a big arena and pay the money? And we all said, yes. <laughs> And so he went off to work with the guy that had put, the queen, put queen on in the, in the West End. And then they announced it, and the most extraordinary thing to us was that they sold out the first house, which is 16,000 seats. It sold out in 40, 43 seconds, I think. 43, four, yeah, yeah. And we were amazed because we thought people had by and large forgotten about us, and we were delighted. And then they added more shows, and then they added another 10. And it was a very happy occasion because the audiences were so wonderful to play to that any of that performance anxiety that we were just disappeared. They were clearly there to have a very, very good time. And I was so relaxed that on the second night, the orchestra did a little joke right at the start. Uh, and I hadn't noticed it on the first night because I'd been watching the audience, but they all stood up and shouted, Ole! at one point and sat down again. <laughs> and it broke me up. The show had not had just started, and I just stood there on stage for about 20 seconds laughing. <laughs> and the audience started to laugh, and the whole thing was like this lovely celebration or, or what's almost a party. And as Eric Idle... Let me read a bit. Eric Idle actually said um, it was a sweet goodbye, and, and uh, it, uh, that's exactly what it was. We enjoyed it enormously. What I say is, in the last analysis, all I know is that the O2 provided the most fun audiences I have encountered in 50 years, and that they turned the evening into a joyous and touching melange of laughter, affection, and mindless goodwill. No wonder the Daily Mail hated it. <laughs> <laughs> There was this uh, great clip that uh, maybe all of you have seen already, but still, um, somebody uh, made some advertisement for what you did in the O2. Let's have a look. Oh, oh yes. yes. Uh, the Monty Python, the shows at the O2. Oh, yeah. Monty Python, are they still going? Yeah, they're doing ten shows. How do you want to go? Ten shows? That's... Wow, that's pretty amazing. They must be corny in. I mean, I bet it's expensive. I mean, but, I mean, who wants to... Who wants to see that again, really? I mean, it was really funny in the 60s. Well, the f first show sold out in 40 seconds. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I mean, still a bunch of wrinkly old men trying to relive their youth and make a load of money. I mean, the best one died years ago. Maybe back in the 70s, it was fantastic. I mean, it was the funniest thing. I mean, I mean, you've seen it all before. I mean, I mean, they put it all up on YouTube. Well. Uh, anyway, um, what did you want to do tomorrow night? Uh, well, we start with something everyone knows, like let's spend the night together and then we can move on to get off my cloud and then... then should hit satisfaction, I think, then. Yeah. Dead parrot sketch? Yeah, dead parrot sketch. Really clever. <laughs> Wasn't that good? <laughs> Uh, Eric and, uh, and Mick, I think. Because Eric has always been much more show business than the rest of us, and he knows all of these guys, David Bowie and, mm. uh, and Mick Jagger, so he rang Mick up, and, and Mick thought it was very funny going on about a bunch of old people getting yeah. together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Let's see where the microphone is and the questions. Over there. Well, um, what is exactly the ingredients to a Waldorf salad? <laughs> I'll tell you what's really extraordinary about it. <laughs> Seriously, no one has ever asked me that before. <laughs> and, and better than that, guess which hotel I stayed in last night? Yeah. Waldorf. It was the Waldorf. It really was. I think it's, it's celery, which I don't like. 
grapes, walnuts. <laughs> Olive oil, vinegar, I don't know. I don't know. I don't like it anyway because of the celery. <laughs> celery is the only thing I absolutely can't eat, except for human flesh. <laughs> <laughs> don't like it, do you? It's got a sort of um, slimy, almost <laughs> fish. It actually is a bit like chicken, I have to admit. And I went off it. I ate it for years, of course, but I went off it a couple of weeks ago. And um, children are all right. They're much more tender. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right, Mr. Cleese, I'm a 55-year-old teacher, I'm afraid to say, and I've been teaching English for a lot of years, and I've always done the parrot sketch, you know, as an example of English humour. And for the recent few years, students go like, they don't really seem to like it, so what can I do to make English humour, and the parrot sketch especially, interesting to them again? Help me, please. <laughs> It's a problem I've had for many years. Yeah. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by what makes people laugh because what people don't understand is just how subjective a sense of humour is, you know? Um, when I do my one-man show, I show film clips and I sit there quietly in the dark in the wings and I watch the front row and they all laugh at different things. You don't realize this. You assume everybody laughs together, particularly because it, it's infectious, right? So laughter is infectious, but if people are watching things on their own at home on television, they laugh at quite different moments. So I don't know how. So your question is how to get them interested? Yeah, because I think the parrot sketches are like an icon of British humor. Yes, you know? but it's a very, very particular type of humor. It is. <laughs> a small part of the dead parrot sketch, and then somebody who took your sketch for completely different reasons. Have a look. Hello, I wish to register a complaint. And I wish to complain about this parrot what I purchased not half an hour ago from this very boutique. Oh, yes, the Norwegian blue. What's wrong with it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It's dead. That's what's wrong with it. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's resting. Look. All right, then. If it's resting, I'll wake it up. Hello, Polly! <laughs> Polly! <laughs> now, that's what I call a dead parrot. No, no, it's stunned. It has ceased to be. It's expired and gone to meet its maker. <laughs> this is an ex-parrot. I will say only this of the Liberal Democrat symbol and of the party it symbolizes. This is an ex-parrot. <laughs> it is not merely stunned, it has ceased to be expired and gone to meet its maker. <laughs> and now for something completely different. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Mm. Well, you inspired her to her funniest moment ever. Absolutely. And I know her foreign policy advisor, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Powell, and he told me that the rehearsal for that took a phenomenally long time. <laughs> <laughs> True. But did you like it that she was... I thought it was wonderful. Of course, yeah. we didn't know. Mm. I mean, we did con uh, consider suing her for copyright, you know, which would, <laughs> would have made us very popular among the Labour voters. Yeah. Did she do well? She did it actually better than I was expecting, yes. No, because I'd heard she was terrible and actually that wasn't so bad, but as I said, there was a lot of rehearsal involved. And yeah. it, it's kind of touching when these things that you come up with pass into the language, like what have the Romans ever done for us, which you, you can hardly pick up a newspaper now in England. I would say every week that, uh, that sort of phrase is, is mentioned. And, and how for something completely different. How often do you get that when you're just walking in a city oh, in Europe? Oh, very little, very little. People really. don't come up to you and they start. No, it's uh, something strange, actually, to one, which is uh, if I'm in a city and nobody knows I'm there, nobody recognizes me. Mm. But if I'm doing five or six shows, by the end of the week, it, I start getting recognized, and it's as though people have heard that I'm in town. But the first couple of days, I don't get recognized at all. Over there, somebody. Over there. It's what very... is your favorite movie? I think my favorite movie was The Sting. The Sting? 
I thought it was so beautifully plotted, so beautifully acted, <clears throat> the sense of period was so strong and had the best soundtrack. Number two is probably Lawrence of Arabia, because I do think that's extraordinary. What's yours? Well, uh, I have been watching your material lately, and um, I saw Life of Brian again. Ah. Oh, yes. And I loved it. It's very good. I loved it, yeah. 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 And um, I thought it was, uh, it, I had to look it up, but it's from 79. Yes. I thought yes. it was more recent, so that makes mm. it very fresh. And also, what, because you're writing about that as well, um, could you make that film again? I mean, would it even be possible to do that film nowadays? I'm not sure. I think it might be quite dangerous. <laughs> because the, the polarization of um, the, uh, the uh, political and religious polarization in America is, uh, worries me terribly. Um, and I, I, what can I say? I'm not so sure that somebody crazy might not shoot us. Uh, at the time, of course, there was a bit of a kerfuffle. And just recently, I read there was one town in England where it was now going to be shown legally for the first time because there were, <laughs> there were ta town councils that banned it. And this was terrific publicity for us. I'm being quite serious, not, not cynical. It was fantastic. And it was like when the film opened in New York, the uh, fundamentalist Christians were out there holding absolutely wonderful... Um, what was it? One, one, one um, of those, what do you call them, um, placards, posters, yep. uh, said, Monty Python is an agent of the devil. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I wish I was on 10% of what he got. You know? <laughs> um, and and, and this, these cues were going, uh, of, of the people that were, were um, uh, protesting, were right next to the cues of all the people going to the cinema. And these were on the news in New York four nights in a yeah. row. And that's when the, the takings went through the roof. So it was completely it's counterproductive. Yeah, it's like the last tango of Paris. You that's right, that's right. How many of your students here, there are students here, have seen uh, Life of Brian? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My next line was, let's refresh your memory, but, that, <laughs> but let's do it anyway. Refresh just, their memory. Just, just a little right. clip. they cut it just before my favorite line because then the, one of the girls says only the true messiah would deny his own divinity <laughs> and graham chapman says all right he says i am the messiah now fuck off <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful mm. just juxtaposition that I am mm. the Messiah now, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> could you make this film about Islam and Muhammad? No, you no. couldn't, because you would get killed. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about it. I mean, you know, we, we, every time we think that the extremists in any religion has gone, have gone as far as they can go, we read about ISIS or IS or something. 
I mean, I have no idea what one does to counter people like IS, who just kill anyone who doesn't agree with them. You know? Mm -hmm. You're given one chance to convert, and if you don't convert, they kill you. Probably, probably by beheading you. Hmm? It looks like the Spanish Inquisition. Yes. Spanish and yet Inquisition. the Spanish Inquisition I was reading last week uh, actually only killed um, 1,200 people. And I was astonished to hear that. But the example I always give is that, you see, I say that an, um, an idea is not responsible for the people who hold it. By which I mean you can take a teaching like Jesus, who did say, blessed is the poor, and you find when you get to America that particularly in the South, uh, Christianity is identified very closely with capitalism. And that's very weird, because it's like the opposite. And the example I give is somebody goes off to an auto de fe during the Spanish Inquisition, um, and, and, and there are people out there being burned for her heretics, and then Jesus comes along and watches this and says, what is going on here? And one of the Spanish Inquisition says, ah, Jesus, well, um, we're burning this people, these guys who are dying in unspeakable agony over a period of hours, because um, they disagree with our interpretation of your gospel of love. <laughs> right? It's beyond ridiculous, isn't it? Do you see what I mean? So you can find people to holding a religion um, for exactly the opposite reason to, that the founders had when they founded the religion. Mm. They can take the whole thing and turn it completely on its head. That's what we were making fun of. All the stuff about the sandal. Mm. Mm. Was Graham Chapman ever in love with you? It's possible. <laughs> I think it's possible. I think it was funny because we were genuinely fond of each other. But he was a very strange guy. <laughs> very, very strange. And I know that when he came out as gay, he did, a, you see, it was very hard to come out as gay when he did, which was 67. Now, I'm not suggesting it's easy necessarily, depending on the society you live in, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not difficult now. But you had worked for a very long time closely six together. Six years, six years. And you had years. no clue whatsoever. I time. had no clue whatsoever. When he came out and said he was, I wonder if I can find that. If I could, um, he, when he said out, uh, came out uh, and, and said that he was gay, he always said that I was shocked. We have that actually, if you, you, yes. Yes? Would you like to see it? The, yeah. yeah, we have the clip in which he says it. Let's yeah. have a look at Good, at and I'll find the right yeah, you thing. you find it. How long did it take you to, to decide if you'd like to come out the closet, to use the common expression? I didn't think that people around me would understand. Um, it took me some time to understand. After all, this was uh, when I was about 25. Uh, 24, I was thinking of getting married. I had a steady girlfriend. Uh, we'd been together for about a year. And then suddenly I found that that wasn't quite what I really wanted, deep down inside. John Cleese, I think, was uh, most uncomfortable when he discovered that he had been working all this time with someone he thought he knew, but now discovered he didn't know. He was <laughs> not the sort of person to, I thought, take very kindly to a little piece of news like that about a friend of his that used to smoke a pipe and play rugby and climb rocks and things like that. It, he was rather shocked, actually. Well, I don't think that's true. Um, <laughs> when I met Gray, he wore those heavy brogue shoes. He wore corduroy trousers, you know? He wore a very hairy sports jacket, and he smoked a pipe, and he was a medical student, and he went mountaineering a lot, and he drank a lot of beer, and he played rugby football. Now, these are not immediate identifying factors <laughs> when you're trying to guess whether someone's gay or not. <laughs> Unless a woman is involved, obviously. <laughs> so, 
it was extraordinary to us because the cover story had been going on for years. But the odd thing is, reading this, um, I have no recollection of it really changing the relationship. I really can't think of any way because it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? But the question was, that was interesting, was he maybe a little bit in love with you? I wondered at one point whether he might be a bit, but you never know. Did you ask him? No. Oh, no, we were much too English to ask questions. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was not on the... Uh, I don't think I could ever ask, for example, Michael Palin if he was in love with me. I don't, I think... Because you think he... <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. he yeah. says he's been married for 42 years, but... Yeah. <laughs> The uh, English are still a little more reticent than some people. I, I think that would be a very difficult question to ask. So. Yeah. When he died, uh, Graham Chapman, uh, you gave uh, a speech. Yeah. And um, it's one of the funniest things I, I have ever, ever seen at a, at a funeral. Let's have a look. Okay. Graham Chapman, co-author of the Parrot Sketch, is no more. He has ceased to be. Good riddance to him, the freeloading bastard I hope he's saw. <laughs> and the reason I feel I should say this <laughs> is he would never forgive me if I didn't, if I threw, threw away this glorious opportunity to shock you all on his behalf. <laughs> Anything for him but mindless good taste. I could hear him whispering in my ear last night as I was writing this, all right, please, he was saying, you're very proud of being the very first person ever to say shit on British television. If this service is really for me, just for starters, I want you to become the first person ever at a British memorial service to say fuck. <laughs> Always look on the bright side of life. Mm. <laughs> well, I do say in the book <clears throat> that although I knew him well, I think he was unknowable, really. I mean, there were wonderful things about him. He was so brave when he was dying so brave because he used to pretend that it wasn't serious but his brother John who was older than him and who was a friend of mine told me that he knew what was going on. He had cancer right? Yeah and we hadn't seen each other any of us for, for some months and he came to a meeting and I suddenly noticed he had this extraordinary dark red it looked like a rash on his neck and I asked him and he started talking I hadn't spoken to him up to that moment in this quite high-pitched voice and this was the effect of the radiation but he was he was absolutely wonderful in some ways I mean he would just behave so badly uh, and it was sometimes it was wonderful and sometimes it was embarrassing I mean he, he one time he was in a pub and he'd taken a dislike to someone in the pub a stranger and he just came up and unzipped his fly and put his willy in the guy's drink. <laughs> <laughs> Another time we were given, um, we were given an award by um, the Sun newspaper and so none of us wanted to go. And uh, he said, I'll go. And it was being handed out, the awards were being handed out by a cabinet minister called Reginald Maudling. And when, uh, when Reginald Maudley said the winner is Monty Python, Graham got up and started walking up towards us and then started screaming and then started crawling up onto the stage, just screaming, screaming, crawling. And Reggie Maudley was absolutely terrified. <laughs> and he came crawling up and leaned up to take the award and Reggie sort of gave it to him like that. And then he went off screaming again. And it was, he was capable of doing things like that, which most of us would hold yeah. back for. And yeah. he almost crushed your bollocks, right? He almost crushed my bollocks, but that's a long story. Yes. Over there, somebody. Over there. Yes. I've seen a speech. The guy who's holding the mic, could you get down a bit further? Just. <laughs> <laughs> Try lying on the ground. <laughs> 
Um, I've seen a speech of you uh, on the internet uh, where you talk about creativity, uh -huh. uh, mostly on what it isn't. Um, and something you, you talk about is that you need an open mode and a closed mode for it. Do you still do these open sessions and uh, what's the best result or the best thing you got out of them recently? Well, um, I started to get interested in, in creativity about 30 years ago because I went to a conference at Cambridge and I started reading the research and then I started comparing it with my own experience. And I got very, very interested in it. And I also got the interested in the fact that basically, once you establish two or three principles, that's all you can say about it. Because to sum up something I sometimes take three hours to say, all creativity comes from the unconscious. If creativity came from logic and intelligence, then all the logical, intelligent people could do it but they can't. It all boils down to getting in a playful and relaxed frame of mind. Most of it's to do with relaxation because unless you're relaxed, you can't hear the promptings from the unconscious. You know, nobody ever had a bright idea when they were attacking a machine gun nest. <laughs> You see what I mean? If you're occupied with activity, and that's one of the reasons why there's so little creativity at the moment, is that nobody gets any peace anymore. Because these damn things are ringing all the time and beep there, and you, know, you, you sit down, there's another uh, email come in. It's absolutely poisonous because interruptions and anxiety will kill any kind of creativity. So you have to get in an atmosphere where you're a little bit, you've got a little cocoon of your own. You close your door or you, you go and sit in the park and you just stay quiet. And for the 20 minutes, nothing happens because you can only think of the things you ought to be doing. You know, people you've forgotten to telephone. So you have to have a little notebook and you write those down. Then after 20 minutes, the mind starts to calm down just as it does in meditation. It's almost identical process. And then when you start thinking about the subject, not too hard. You don't want to get tense. You just kind of play with the thought and you get little ideas start popping up. But if your mind is full of, mm, mm, you know, you'll never hear those little ideas. It'll be drowned out. Do you see what I mean? I wrote in your, uh, read in your book that uh, somebody like Vermeer, the painter um, from the Netherlands, is, is, has that effect maybe on you, that you really come into a zone where yes. it's nice. You see, you something can... you can use music to help you get into that zone. But the main thing is just to be quiet and not to be interrupted. Or I once interviewed the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. and I said to the Dalai Lama, why do Buddhists giggle all the time? Because they do. They just see the whole thing as a joke, you know, and they're wonderful to be around. But he answered a different question. He said, what I like about laughter is that when people laugh, they can change their minds. And we become much more flexible uh, when we're not threatened. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's where the relaxation and the humor comes from. Uh, so, as I could say a lot more, but that's the general picture. It's, it's, it's being quiet enough to listen to the promptings of your unconscious. Here, over there. Mr. John Cleese, a wise man once told me he doesn't have the bollocks. It was my father when I told him to get up and ask the question he's been waiting to ask Phil. Well, since we had the tickets, so I give you my father. <laughs> <laughs> You can just give him a clip around the ear if you like. Won't you? <laughs> I will, I'll get him later. For that. <laughs> oh, he's driving. Afterwards, afterwards. He's driving. Um, Not in front of him. I just remember um, um, from the uh, Secret Policeman's Ball, you, do you were that. doing the albatross uh, oh, yeah. thing, which I really liked. And you said to somebody, You're not supposed to be smoking that. Oh, Was somebody that's... really smoking something? Oh, yes. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Oh, he was definitely, they were smoking oh, they. something. I okay, mean, when he yeah. walked out on stage, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was great. But again, they were a great audience because they were so relaxed. And the other thing that was so lovely, <laughs> so lovely about the Hollywood Bowl is that we were in the open air. And yeah, there's yeah. something incredibly attractive about any performance that's done in the open air. I can't, I don't know why, it's just so special always. 
I think the best production I ever saw was, Mids uh, was uh, Midsummer Night's Dream in, 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 in the park in, um, in New York. Central Park. Central Park in New York. It was the most magical evening I ever had. The best place to see anything, music or theatre. It's theater. just it's extraordinary beautiful. what yeah. being in the, in, the, in the air does. It just changes something, makes it magical. Yeah. Did, what did you think of his question? What did you think of... <laughs> <laughs> what did you oh, think I of my forgot question? forgot it's his father, no, it's of course. He doesn't care. Over here, behind you. So, Mr. Cleese. Oh, right over here. there. Hello. <laughs> uh, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Um, 1642. Thank you very much. He died in August 1642. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That's Cardinal Richelieu who died in 1642. You remember stuff? I remember very silly stuff. I know, <clears throat> I know we did a German show once, and one of the phrases that was in the German show was, uh, I can kill bats with an egg spoon. Ich kann mit einem Eierlöffel Fledermäuse töten. <laughs> and it's very useful. It's, it's surprising. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here it is, On one here. occasion, I was at a police function. They'd asked me to go along to draw the raffle or something. And this young English, this young English copper came up to me and <clears throat> said, this is Heidi, my girlfriend, she's German. <laughs> <laughs> can you say? something to her in German, and I said, yeah, ich kann mit einem Eierlöffel for Fledermäuse turn. <laughs> and Heidi said, wirklich? <laughs> it's funny, because I thought of this today. I think one of the guys who said more funny things than almost anyone was Mark Twain. Mm. You know what he said about the German sense of humor? He said, it is no laughing matter. <laughs> Anything about the Netherlands? Hmm. No, the strange thing about the English language is that we have a lot of insult Double Dutch. lines about the Dutch. Dutch courage is alcohol. Mm -hmm. Double Dutch, a Dutch auction, a Dutch wife, all these phrases, and yet... What's the Dutch wife? It's a sort of um, plastic inflatable woman. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly came up with my rude question. Oh, yes. Go Did on. you ever have a Dutch woman? I don't think so. There was one occasion, I've never told anyone this before, I was in Copenhagen and I was in bed with a Danish girl and she suddenly started laughing out of the blue, uncontrollable fits of laughter. And I looked at her and I said, Basil Forty, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Was this before, after, or during? Uh, just after. <laughs> <laughs> Over there, in the... Yeah. Hello, Mr. Cleese. Hello. <laughs> I wanted to... Uh, as, a, uh, as an intellectual man that you are, uh, Cambridge educated, I wanted to ask you a very intelligent question. So, uh, here it is. Uh, is there anybody in Western Europe you would uh, like to punch in the face? <laughs> I think the editor of the Daily Mail would give me. <laughs> we did a we did a very good joke about him, right? When Michael Palin and I were doing the uh, the parrot sketch at the at the O O two, all those ten performances, a moment when he goes off to see if he's got a live parrot to replace the dead one, and I just used to say th anything that came in my head to the audience. And on the last night when he went off, I said to the audience, I was listening using that voice. I was listening to the radio this morning and apparently the editor of the Daily Mail, Mr. Paul Dacre, has had an asshole transplant. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael Palin came onto the stage and I looked at him 
And he said, yeah, I was listening to the television. Apparently, the asshole has rejected him. (laughs) (laughs) This is the most gloriously rude joke I know. (laughs) So I think that that, I think the British press have have got to clean their act up. And then after that, the lawyers. Mm. And next, the police. But in that order, you know. Over there. I read an interview that you gave, and you said that um, films like James Bond, or specifically James Bond, is um, really focusing on the Asian market, which means that like subtle British humor is like yeah, dying, sounds a bit depressing, but it's like disappearing. Do you think that that's a trend in the film industry, that much more movies just lose their British humor for like the Asian people who just aren't artsy, as you say it? Well, the thing was, what they, the Bond people have been astonishingly clever financially. Uh, the first one I made took 450 million. The next one I was in took 550. The next one took 600. I mean. They went up these huge amounts, 100 million a time. And what they were doing is they were looking at the audiences and deciding where is the money. And what they realized was that in Asia, people love them, but they love the action sequences. And they didn't pick up, obviously, jokes about the class system. So that's when they'd started to downplay the comedy. They got rid of Q in the next movie. I wasn't, you know, I was R, and then I was Q, and then I wasn't there anymore because they replaced Pierce. And when you think that Bond was supposed to be an old Etonian, Pierce could pass for that, slight, you know, slightly classy. But Daniel Craig is a sort of tiny little Welsh guy with uh, <laughs> little bandy legs. Have you seen him? <laughs> Have you seen Daniel Craig's legs? <laughs> oh, that's why he comes out of the water with the water up to his waist, you see. <laughs> if he came any further out of the water, the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being naughty. But actually, being in the Bond films is one of the best experiences I ever had. But I think it's a shame that the American influence is always that more money is better. And I think there's a moment when you have enough money to do good stuff, but Americans do not understand the meaning of the phrase, enough money. Do you see what I mean? Um, since you were talking about him, Daniel Craig, we, we have a little clip in a little film we made for you um, about a guy who is on this stage many times, very famous uh, Dutch comedian, yes. and a big fan of yours as well. Let's have a look. Je leert van John Cleese dat het mag, het moet grappig zijn, het is grappig. En het mag ook eigenlijk heel erg flauw zijn. This is it. I'm gonna give you a damn good trashing. The very real problem is what I'm I'm afraid that the Ministry of State is no longer getting the kind of support. Er zijn zoveel goede Monty Python uh, scènes. Van uh, silly walks tot silly jobs. How irritate people, the dead parrot. I wish to complain about this parrot. What I purchased not half an hour ago from this very boutique. Oh yes, sir, the Norwegian blue. What's wrong with it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it, my lad. It's dead. That's what's wrong with it. No, no, I see. It's resting, look. <laughs> Wat voor comedian is John Cleese? Een hele prettige... Schaamteloze idioot. Listen, don't mention the war. I mentioned it once, but I think I got away with it all right. <laughs> so, we are what? Who's this then? Stop you, my no, no, no. <laughs> I'll do the funny more. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, the Towers, vind ik het moment waarop zijn vrouw in het ziekenhuis ligt en hij een hele donkere dokter in het ziekenhuis tegenkomt. Mr. Forty? <laughs> Zo geestig. Vooral ook in die tijd toen. Archie? Hmm? Do you speak Italian? I am Italian. Sono Italiano in spirito. A fish called Wanda. Hij uh, heeft in James Bond gespeeld en Harry Potter gespeeld. And you might be. This is 007. If you're Q, does that make him R? My life of Brian is voor mij nog steeds het absolute meeste. Right 
de reunie van afgelopen uh, zomer uh, in Londen. Ik las dat het heel goed was. Who would have thought 40 years ago we'd all be sitting here doing Monty Python? Eh? No, I am. Right. Oh, I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I work all night and I sleep all day. En het was geloof ik in drie seconden uitverkocht. I'm here, frankly, because I need the money. <laughs> dat hij de laatste tour heeft gedaan om de alimentatie van zijn derde ex-vrouw te betalen. Uh, ja, vind ik ook alweer heel geestig. And here is a recent photograph of my ex-wife at a London ATM, helping herself to some of my money. Ja, ik ben benieuwd naar hoe, hoe ze via de huwelijk gaat. <laughs> Um, he's wondering how your, your marriage is nowadays, if you're good. You see that? I've never worn one of those before. Uh. That's true. And Jenny made it for me. She's a jewellery designer, so she made me that ring. But where I came from, Western Supermare, the men didn't wear any kind of jewellery in case people thought... Mm. Quite seriously, they didn't wear it. And uh, my dad never wore a wedding band, and I never wore one until I met. Uh, Jenny, and I uh, just thought I had this extraordinary feeling this is the most important relationship I'll ever have, and it's, uh, it's still going at two and a half years, which is like a world record for me. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we take uh, one more question from um, over there, maybe? Hello. I came for an argument. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> yes, I did. No, you didn't. Am I in the wrong room? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Another one over there with the blue T-shirt. Blue T-shirt. Uh, I read that you uh, uh, had very much like the part of Brian in Life of Brian yourself. Uh, is that true? And if so, is it something you still regret? No, I don't regret it because the other Pythons got it right. The reason I wanted to play Brian is I had reached the, 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 the grand old age. That was 1978. So I was born in 39, so I was 40 years of age, and I'd never played a lead in a movie. And I wanted to have the experience of, of playing one character all through the movie, instead of lots of different characters. I wanted to know what it was like. And uh, I was quite wrong, but I wasn't after the part because I thought it was a wonderful part, or I thought it was funny, I just wanted that experience. Uh, the others said, no, it must be great, and he did it wonderfully well. He did it better than I would have done. And I was better off playing the centurion and Reg the revolutionary. So the, the, uh, the, the Pythons were absolutely right about that, and I didn't, I, the only time I ever played a lead in, in a movie was 1985, when uh, I was given a lead in a movie called Clockwise. And it's good, isn't it? I think we should yes. go home. Uh, <laughs> actually, I was thinking the same. <laughs> yeah, no, really. Uh, well, I have one last question always. It's prepared. What is the best advice you could, you could give to us here in Carré and for the people who are watching this at home? The advice in life? Yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> Something about which I've changed my mind hugely in the last five years, maybe seven years. What I've realized is that we totally underestimate the huge part that luck plays in our lives. A huge part that luck plays. And so many people who have reputations for being wizard financiers, you know, they were just lucky. And I see now that if I was trying to tell a kid something, I would say the most important thing is persistence. Because if you keep trying, sooner or later you're going to get lucky. But don't think that you're brilliant and that you just do it once and going to be a success because there are lots of smart people from places like Oxford who are so clever at Oxford and who never ever achieve anything because they kind of feel they should be, they feel entitled. So I would say life is enormously about luck. So the answer is persistence. Just keep plugging away. And I would not have said that five or ten years ago. John Cleese. That was good so fun. Much. That was fun. <laughs> we had fun. Easy. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. So much really easy. Stay air.